This is one of wrestling's legendary travel stories, a true story that led to fights, firings, a missing mullet, and a sexual harassment lawsuit. And it all happened at 30,000 feet. Promoting UK only events was nothing new for WWE in 2002. These shows were a way to make a ton of cash in one night by taking advantage of the rabid British fanbase. Insurrection in May took place in London at Wembley Arena, live on pay per view in front of nearly 10,000 fans. As all UK pay per views at the time, this show was inconsequential and basically a televised house show. Nothing that happened on the show would have an impact on storylines going forward. However, what happened after the show would go down in history as the most incredible wrestling road story of the modern era. Vince at the time was chartering flights. We weren't on commercial flights, we'd rent a whole plane. We had a 747 all to ourselves. So we have every cameraman, all the girls that make the costumes, tour managers, everybody. A plane full of WWE people. With that comes a free and open bar. It was a plane filled with alcoholic wrestlers at the end of a gruelling tour. So think about it, it's like the last day of school. You might think that the relief to see an end of a foreign tour and a copious amount of free booze could potentially lead to an uninhibited environment amongst the wrestlers on the flight, and it certainly did. The late flight also probably caused tensions to rise, but there was another ingredient to add to the mix before the situation could become explosive. It was brewing. Everybody had their different little deals they were doing. Some people were doing GHB, getting pilled up, whatever, you know? You could buy GHB in the health food store. It was legal, so that was the reason everyone was doing it. But it f***ed you up. After the incidents that occurred on this flight, two wrestlers would end up losing their jobs. One of them was 43-year-old Scott Hall. Scott Hall was one of the most famous wrestlers on the flight, a bona fide main eventer of over a decade at this point, and with all that success, came a big bag full of personal issues around substance abuse. Before becoming a professional wrestler, Hall was a bouncer at a strip club in Orlando. On one Saturday night in January 1983, his life was going to change forever. I remember what he was wearing, what I was wearing, what it smelled like. It's burned into my brain. After an altercation outside the club, Hall wrestled a gun from the hand of a man in line and shot him dead with it. He was charged with second degree murder. The charges against Hall were eventually dropped due to insufficient evidence, and Hall began trying to turn his life around by training to become a pro wrestler. Mentally, however, Hall could not move on from the incident in his past. I did probably the most unhealthy thing I could have done. I should have sought counselling right then, but I didn't know anything. I was a kid. Hall became notorious in the wrestling business throughout the 90s for his drug abuse issues and would often seek to alter his mind through the use of alcohol, cocaine and prescription drugs. And just as nobody knows what sparked the altercation outside the club in 1983, it is a mystery as to the full extent of his role on the chartered flight. You know, that whole trip, it was just kind of a blur of pills and booze. There are mixed reports as to Hall's behaviour on the flight. Reports have varied from saying he and Kurt Hennig were enjoying some innocent fun early into the flight by squirting shaving foam all over the cabin, all the way to the far more serious accusation that Hall sexually harassed one of the flight attendants. Whatever happened, Hall was unconscious before long. He passed out so deeply that people had to check his pulse to see if he was still alive. I had to babysit Scott. I had to stay straight because everyone else was so f***ed up. And yet Hall was one of the two wrestlers to be released from their contract the day after the incident, despite others being more deeply involved. That being said, this wasn't the first time that Hall had made his personal demons public, so perhaps it was the straw that broke the camel's back. Hall was almost relieved to be fired. It wasn't fun, so the money starts to mean less. I can be miserable at home, I don't need to be on the road to be miserable. And that's the way it ended. Scott Hall's in-ring career effectively ended that day. What ensued was years of rehab, and happily today, he's clean and sober, living his best life. In the years since 2002, he's become a true legend of the wrestling business, entering WWE's Hall of Fame. Scott Hall was one of the most famous wrestlers on that flight, but he wasn't the most famous. Ghost of the Nature Boy 
Ric Flair. Ric Flair is an icon in the world of professional wrestling, with a main event career spanning decades and multiple world championship reigns, his first reign being in 1981. Many say Flair is the blueprint for what a true superstar should be in sports entertainment. Flair ticked all of the boxes, he was charismatic, an incredible talker on the microphone, and he wrestled some of the most enthralling matches ever recorded on film. Often, wrestling fans struggle to watch matches that took place back in the 1980s due to the style of match being much slower paced than today's in-ring work. There's a testament then to Ric Flair that you can go back and watch any of his matches from that era and still be enthralled by his performance. There's a mantra in wrestling circles that says that the most believable characters are those that are themselves with the volume turned way up, and Ric Flair turned his volume up all the way to 11. His character was an international playboy, flying around in helicopters and personal jets, dripping in gold jewellery, with women at his knees every single night. He was a wrestling bad guy that knew he was the bad guy, happily accepting the moniker of dirtiest player in the game. And for Flair, the character and the real life man were almost inseparable. As anyone that knew him at the time will tell you, the Ric Flair you saw on TV and in the ring was the same Ric Flair as you knew in reality. Fast forward to 2002, his best days in the ring were long behind him, but WWE still saw the value in the legendary figure by employing him as an on-screen manager and part-time wrestler. Despite being broken down physically, Flair had lost none of the spirit that had originally led him to be called the Nature Boy. Then Flair comes out in his robe, nothing on underneath, balls naked, strutting down the hallway. 60 year old man, junk flying everywhere, going up to the stewardesses saying, come on sweetheart, woo. For Flair, this was perhaps normal behaviour, or behaviour he could at least get away with in his younger days as the styling and profiling NWA world champion. However, this was 2002, not 1982. And two of the flight attendants on board the chartered flight were not impressed. The phrase not impressed isn't strong enough considering they chronicled their allegations in a lawsuit. According to the women, Flair done nothing but his famous jeweled rope and proceeded to flash his penis at them. Furthermore, Flair grabbed their hands and forced them to touch him before restraining one of the women at the back of the galley and assaulting her individually. In the interim, Ric Flair has denied the incident set out in the lawsuit and WWE eventually settled out of court with both women. No wonder, considering Flair was one half of the WWE Tag Team Champions at the time. The lawsuit contained further allegations against another veteran wrestler on the flight, Dustin Runnels, aka Goldust. Dustin Runnels allegedly grabbed one of the flight attendants repeatedly before telling her, you and me are going to f before grabbing her rear. The documents for this lawsuit are readily available online. We'll never know whether any of the accusations were true because as I mentioned before, the plaintiff settled out of court with WWE and in interviews with wrestlers who were on the flight, they never mentioned anything to do with the stewardesses, apart from certain people asking them to dispose of syringes. Dustin Runnels was a decades-long veteran of the wrestling business. His father was Dusty Rhodes, a three-time world champion and adversary to Ric Flair. Dustin had a tumultuous relationship with his father, despite being in the same business, but perhaps genetically still inherited his father's in-ring work rate and understanding of psychology. Dustin began his career in 1988, taking his father's wrestling surname, and it wasn't long before he joined America's second biggest wrestling promotion, WCW, in 1990. It was here that Dustin would meet his future wife, Terry. Fast forward to 1995, Dustin and Terry were now married, and they signed with WWE, and Dustin was about to get a radical character change. 
Goldust was one of the edgiest gimmicks ever seen in wrestling up until that point. The character was portrayed as a drag queen, obsessed with films and everything gold. A character that used in-ring psychology to his advantage, often using lewd and flirtatious mind games to anger, confuse and distract his opponents. Terry was his on-screen manager. By 1999, their real-life marriage had broken down and they divorced with a child between them. Being a part of a touring company such as WWE sometimes means being on the road long-term with ex-partners, however difficult that might be. After an hour into the flight, Dustin took control of the plane's in-flight PA system to serenade his ex-wife, much to her embarrassment. All of a sudden, I could hear a David Allen Coe song sung as only my ex-husband could sing it and i remember paul Heyman telling me don't sell it just sit back and go to sleep he sang the full damn song on that flight and yeah it was bad for me reportedly runnels changed some of the lyrics in the song to a very personal degree shall we say and the entire plane heard it jim ross was one of wwe's most powerful staff members in 2002 as head of talent relations and he had to step in to stop the commotion. Having a company boss like Jim Ross step in would affect Ruddle's career going forward, as WWE stopped using him on television for the rest of the year, and agreed to release him from his contract when it was finished. Luckily, Dustin would eventually return to favour with WWE, and went on to have a long career with them that finished just a couple of years ago. Michael Hayes began his wrestling career in the late 1970s at a time when hard living really started to become a lifestyle trait of the grappling professional. Just like the rock stars of the time, drink, drugs and partying through the night was very much on the agenda after the stage lights went out and things were no different for Hayes. In fact, along with his tag team partners Terry Gordy and Buddy Roberts, Hayes took things one step further they formed a tag team known as the Fabulous Freebirds and were very much connected with the rock music of the time where their entire gimmick was that of hard rockers. Speaking to Rolling Stone magazine, Hayes said, Back then, the one thing you would hear over and over again was live your gimmick. Well, we were kind of living that gimmick anyway. We were a rock and roll band in and out of the ring. Since the late 90s, it's been common to see wrestlers enter the ring to real life rock songs. The Freebirds did it first, coming to the ring to Freebird by Lyddard Skinnard. And you know what they say, once a rocker, always a rocker. Let's fast forward to 2002. Hayes almost p***ed on Linda McMahon. He was all fucked up, tried to whip his out. He doesn't know it's Linda in front of him. He thinks he's at a f***ing bathroom. Someone had to come and lead him away. The new generation of younger wrestlers like Waltman and Credible were already resentful of Hayes, now in his 50s, for abusing his power as an important producer in WWE. He was getting real bad, and he's got a lot of heat anyway. Nobody likes him. He was drunk, rowdy as f***, just being loud and obnoxious. Hayes next decided to punch wrestler John Layfield, aka JBL, in the face. JBL had already bled during his match at the show in London, so Hayes just decided to open that up. So now JBL's in a suit, nice clothes, and he's busted wide open, bleeding like a pig over his suit. He wanted to go after Hayes, but JBL's a wrestler, and Hayes is office. He's like your boss. What are you going to do? Kick your boss's ass? Luckily, Sean Walkman had an idea for revenge. Hayes is out cold and he's still got that f***ing ponytail. That mullet he was still rocking. Everybody's like, no, 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 you're not going to do it. Everybody's looking and they don't think I'm going to do it. I just grabbed that f***ing tail and I lifted up and I just went whack and the whole plane just erupted. Hayes wouldn't realise he was missing his ponytail until he later went through customs. He wasn't happy, but nobody snitched on Walkman, who kept the mullet with him and pinned it to a wall at the next event for Hayes to find. For people who specifically train to become professional wrestlers, they train to become entertainers, protecting themselves and their opponents in a predetermined sport. And then there are real sportsmen who later train to become professional wrestlers. They quite often start out as amateur wrestlers. Brock Lesnar was, and still is, one of professional wrestling's most fearsome performers. 
a man who had a hugely successful career in amateur wrestling and after his first stint with WWE went on to become a UFC heavyweight champion. In May 2002, during the plane ride from hell, Lesnar was just starting his career as a WWE superstar and as always, there were long in the tooth wrestlers just waiting to try and take down the legitimate tough man. By 2002, Mr Perfect Kurt Hennig had established himself in his arena as one of the best wrestlers of all time. He had originally been with WWE between 1988 and 1996, where his gimmick was that he was the perfect sportsman, a man that could not be outperformed and for the first couple of years was completely undefeated. Hulk Hogan said everybody would check their egos at the door when they came to a building that Kurt Hennig was in, because you couldn't outwork him, you couldn't outshine him and you couldn't outperform him. He was the best of the best, so here were two men considered excellent athletes sitting next to each other on the 8 hour flight. There was a big difference between them however, Brock was 25 years old with his entire career ahead of him, whereas Kurt was 43 and coming towards the end of his career. One of the scariest moments on the flight was Brock Lesnar and Kurt Hennig. I think it all started with Kurt making fun of Brock and the amateur wrestling. He really got under Brock's skin and the next thing you know, you could look at Brock and see him turn bright red. All of a sudden, these guys jump in and they're right in each other's face. Aggression escalated quickly between Hennig and Lesnar at 35,000 feet. At first, the other wrestlers were reluctant to step in, what with each man's reputation. Before long, Lesnar took down Hennig and the men were scuffling down the aisle. The scuffle started to turn serious as the pilot had to get on the PA system and asked the two men to return to their seats. The situation was about to become serious for everyone on the flight. They didn't want to give in to each other. They went at it so hard that they almost popped open the emergency exit. 25, 30,000 feet in the air. These guys were fighting into the big exit door. Literally the plane was rocking around as these guys were in such a physical battle. That was probably the scariest thing that happened on the flight. I was scared. Some of the others on the flight finally saw sense and piled in to break the fight up before it went any further, calming both guys down and showing them back to their seats. Brock Lesnar went on to become the highest paid WWE superstar in 2020, while unfortunately Kurt Hennig, who was fired the day after the flight, will be dead in less than 12 months due to complications with steroids and painkillers. Quite incredibly, a similar incident occurred previously, this time involving WWE's chairman, Vince McMahon. On what would have been the same flight from London to New York after a UK pay-per-view almost a year before to the day. On that show, Stone Cold Steve Austin wrestled The Undertaker in the main event and injured the dead man's ear. He had intended to take some painkillers and get some rest on the 8 hour flight home, however that would be rudely interrupted. Kurt Angle, a legitimate Olympic gold medal winner in amateur wrestling, joined WWE in 1999 and company boss Vince McMahon was obsessed with taking him down. As The Undertaker stirred in his seat, he saw Kurt on top of Vince in the middle of the aisle. They were right in front of me, they were at my feet. So I come to, I hear all of this and I see Kurt on Vince and I just went, oh hell no. The Undertaker jumped to his boss's defence by jumping on Kurt Angle and locking in a chokehold. So I locked that in tight, Kurt was like, take, he could barely get it out. He's like, take, you're gonna choke me. So I let go and by that time they're like, no, they're just playing. So I'm like, oh shit, and I let go. Went back down in my seat and went out cold. Not much was learned from that first incident, but plenty was taken away from the situation in 2002. Head of Talent Relations Jim Ross was disgusted enough by the behaviour to enact changes to the company. I remember Jim Ross sitting in baggage claim with his briefcase, just going like this. That look of disgust. Ross went on to post a statement on WWE.com saying, Procedures have been put in place to ensure such conduct does not occur in the future. The bottom line is this. Yours truly is the person in charge of the talent roster and the book stops with me. We will do all we humanly can to solve the problem. Scott Hall and Kurt Enig both lost their jobs. Hall's road to recovery spanning almost two decades started there on that flight. Dustin Runnels lost his TV time and was eventually dropped. And two lawsuits forced WWE to make changes to travel arrangements 
so the entire roster was not to travel by air at the same time. Later on, frequent drug testing was enacted by WWE to ensure the health and well-being of their roster. Road stories like this have become fewer and further between in recent years as the wrestling business has taken steps to clean up its reputation and presentation. But the plane ride from hell will always remain an example as to how the real world of professional wrestling can be more unhinged than anything that we see on TV every week.